I think that's what puts a lot of businesses out of business is if you can't tell me what your profitability is and like your profit percentage per job, how can you scale? Because you could like... All right, what's up guys? I am here with Barbara Strehans, your tax coach. And we're going to talk about tax strategy. We're going to talk about how to possibly pay less in taxes. That think that sounds pretty good to most people. I saw Barbara speak at an event back in July of 2022 down in Charlotte, part of the Champions Circle event, and uh, she had the whole room kind of captivated on like, whoa, like I did not know these things. I've been in business for a long time, and I think everyone was on the edge of their seats. Um, I think we ran out of time for all the questions that that we were asking Barbara in terms of like. You know, what can I do? What can I do? What can I write off as a business expense and all that sort of thing? We kind of got uh, into some fun topics there. But I wanted to bring Barbara on because, like, this has been something that's been on my mind for, you know, the past few months. And I know that our market, contractors, construction companies, really anyone can benefit from some of these tips that are just things that we're not, you know, we're not taught. Like I have a finance degree from a a pretty good university uh, business school. And, uh, you know, that was many years ago, but I uh, was never like kind of taught about these things. Um, Being in business 10 years is something that I wish I had known earlier. So I'm excited to bring this content to you, bring Barbara to you guys. And uh, without further ado, what's going on, Barbara? Hey, how's it going? Awesome. Awesome. So we'll get into that. uh, Hopefully some juicy topics that I kind of teased there, but just a quick background, some context, like who you are, you know, what you do, that sort of thing. Yeah. So I'm the founder of Your Tax Coach and I've been doing taxes for, this will be coming on 14 years now. And when I started, I started at the biggest accounting firm in the world because that's kind of like in college, they tell you if you go there, then you've really made it, you know? And I made it there and I was like, well, this is not what I had hoped for it to be. And so I kind of found myself like switching accounting firms because I just wanted to help small business owners save money in taxes and I wasn't finding it anywhere. So that's how your tax coach was born. And now that's all we do is save business owners a lot of money in taxes. All right. Well, I think you got people paying attention. Um, yeah. So I, I went to business school, like I said, and then uh, during one of the summers during college, I interned at an accounting firm, a really good firm, uh, one that I, I, I use today and that my family has used for uh, 20 or 25 years or so. And um, I worked you know, under an awesome partner, Jim Burke, and uh, it was cool, but I realized that I did not like that. I didn't want to do accounting. So it was good. A you know, sometimes you, you, <laughs> <laughs> you try things and you're like, yeah, all right, this is not for me. Like, do I want to do this for the next 40 years? No, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was my experience with accounting, but as a business owner, it's something that we, you know, whether we like it or not, it's part of our businesses and our lives, uh, especially for, you know, small businesses, family businesses, like this stuff can have a really big effect on our lives. So, so what exactly is it that you guys do, uh, at your tax coach? So we will dig into your business and find ways for you to save that you're not already doing. And so kind of the first thing we do is look at how you're structured, because a lot of times businesses are not structured the way that they could be or should be or what the most tax advantageous is. Or maybe they are from a tax standpoint, but they want to sell their business. That's a very different way to structure as well. So really restructuring is the first start. And then We'll kind of dig into how do you spend your money, how do you live your life, and how we can turn those into business expenses. And after that, we really clean up their books so you know your numbers. And then we have a bunch of like ninja tax strategies that we can implement too. All right. Let's save those for the end. Let's give a little (laughs) uh, teaser at the end for some ninja stuff. Um, So the way that business is structured, I think I, I know what you're talking about there, but for the audience, like... What do you mean by that, uh, the structure of the business? So a lot of times newer business owners will just start a business and not even have their LLC, for example. And so that's a huge one. Like get your LLC, especially contractors. Oh my gosh, you could be so liable for a lot of different things. So please get your LLC. But as you grow, you also don't want to just stay as an LLC either. So 
if you're profiting like over $40,000 a year, we always suggest switching over to an S corporation, which that in and of itself can save you like $25,000 a year in taxes. Double that if maybe you own it with a spouse as well. So there could be huge tax savings there. Or I see if you own it with someone else, like it's a partnership, you should not be an S corp. And so I see a lot of that where there's like two owner S corps and that's not a good way to structure. So there's so many different like ins and outs, but I think a big one that probably a lot of your audience, if it's just a single owner, you should probably be an S corp. Okay. Uh, so I'm a single owner LLC and we file as an S corp. Does that make sense or should I yes. not be doing that? Yeah. Yeah. So that's correct. Oh, yes. All right. Good. So you can't, I'm doing something. you can't be an S corp unless you've had your LLC first. So oh, okay. You're good. All right. I'm doing something right. At least one thing. That's cool. <laughs> All right. So, so you have your business structure. What's unique about, you know, maybe it's contractors or, you know, small business in general, like where you have in the, an owner operator is a closely, you know, family business, that sort of thing. Like, I think there are some unique things there yeah, as opposed to like a big corporation. Right. So, you know, like what, what are some of those things about, about contractors that are, you know, why is it so important to get this stuff right? Well, I would say with a lot of contractors, you're a little messy uh, <laughs> and may not keep your receipts and keep things separated. So that's like the first thing that we'll help you with is like figuring out a system that works to keep your receipts because yes, you have to keep them. I know it's very annoying. Bank statements don't count as a receipt. So you really got to keep those. And then really knowing your numbers. I think that's what puts a lot of businesses out of business is if you can't tell me what your profitability is and like your profit percentage per job, how can you scale? Because you could like people will come to us like I made a million dollars last month in roofing and it's like, OK, cool. What's your profitability per project? You could be at a loss for that. Maybe if you did really, really well, you're at 15 percent. But even then you're not you don't have a lot of wiggle room. So knowing your numbers is also really huge. These have nothing to do with tax savings. This is just like kind of foundational things. But once you have those once we really know your profitability and how to tweak some things so that you have a higher, the point is like you want to make more, right? And keep more home. So then it's really like, how do you spend your money is the biggest part. And you asked at the very beginning, like, how can a business owner maybe not pay anything in taxes? And it's 100% possible. It all depends on how you spend your money. So in terms of like deductions for your small business, you can, you know, write off your cars and meals and trips that you're taking. And so most of your life could and should be a business expense. And then once you have all of those deducted and you still have profit, if you invest in certain things, which again, another huge tip for contractors is like, you don't want to do this forever, right? Because you're going to get old at some point and the work's going to get harder to do. So invest the money that you do make smartly. So then you can have a retirement and certain investments incentivize you to do so with tax savings. So there's a lot of different ways. Okay. Sounds good. Um, yeah. Back to like knowing your numbers and profitability on services and different jobs. Like that was me the first three years of, of this business contractor dynamics marketing company where we were doing like all sorts of different services. We don't now, but we like, we were doing all sorts of different things. And like, we didn't know, I didn't know like what was making us money and what wasn't. Yeah. And uh, I hired a business coach. He became a part, a business partner of mine for a couple of years. And we just kind of like, I remember he came into our office one day, we had this whiteboard uh, paint. Like, so the entire wall of the office was like a big giant whiteboard. And we're just like doing the numbers for like a half a day and like found out that services that we were offering, like we were paying our clients to be clients. Like we, yeah. were, we were losing money. And uh, that was like a huge eye opener to me. You know, it took me three years to figure that out because I was just kind of head down hustling for a, a few years. And I think that's like, you know, what a lot of business owners do, you know, you just keep your head down. You're like, I just, I'm paying the bills. I'm making some money. I'm bringing some home and I'm not, you know, I don't really know the numbers, but I'm just going to keep going. Right. Yeah. And especially if you have other services that kind of hide 
those loss services, it's hard It's hard to see. Right, right. Absolutely. So that's one of the things that I personally don't do a good enough job at is, is using some of those business expenses um, or, you know, meals, travel, those sorts of things. Like, so when you were talking back in July, I was like, wow, like I'm kind of being too good. Like, you know, yeah. I obviously I want to be legal and ethical, but like, I can be, you know, using my business as a vehicle much more than I am right now. Mm -hmm. So like, what are some of those common things? Like you mentioned travel, like, can I go on a vacation with my family and write that off? Like, how does that all work? So I always tell people, you're never going on a family vacation. You're going on a business trip, right? So the first intent of a trip has to be that it's for business. So, you know, even though you might be going to Disney World, for example, maybe the intent of you going there is so you can network with another business owner friend that you have and you can talk about collaborating and becoming a partner and and that kind of stuff. So you have to notate your intent. And I just do it on my Google calendar because I keep everything on there. So whenever I'm traveling, I always put what it's for, who's there. And that way, if we're ever audited like years down the road, you'll remember where and why you were at that certain time. But you should be able to write off most of your travel for domestic travel. So within the U.S., you just have to have 50 percent of the days be business related. So if you're going somewhere for a week, you only need four of the seven days to be business related and the travel there and the travel back automatically counts as business. So you really only need two of those days. So back to like the Disney World example, you travel to Disney World, that counts as a business day. Maybe one of the days you meet with that person that is supposed to become a partner or collaborator with you. And maybe another day you film content at Disney World to post on your social media. And the way back, there's your four days and the rest of the time is like, hey, go have fun. So those sorts of things, like I'm out there, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm creating some reels on at Disney World and like that's a business thing because I'm, I'm doing some content for my business social media. Yeah. As long as there's a profit motive behind it. So like, okay, are you trying to post on social media to get clients? Sure. Of course you are. Right. We're not just there on social media to like waste time and mindlessly scroll. Like we hope eventually we'll get some clients out of it. So I would say that's a profit motive for sure. Okay. And then keeping things like those notes in your Google calendar, like you mentioned, that that is enough documentation to satisfy any curious eyes or? Yeah, for the most part. But I will say I'm very detailed with my Google calendar. So if I am like meeting that person that maybe I'm collaborating with, I'll put like from 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. was our meeting and this is what we chatted about. You can do it however is easy for you if you have like a Google Sheet or a notes app in your phone or however you do it. It's just for me, like if I keep everything on my calendar, it's very easy and in one place. But but yeah, you can as long as it's like what's the topic, who was there, you're good to go. All right. That's pretty eye opening right there. Okay. And that's like, you know, I'm a hundred percent owner. My wife is not involved in the business at all. So that even that's cool. Like we're going on family vacation or a business trip as a family, like that's okay. So the expenses for your wife would not count unless, and we do this for a ton of our clients. Maybe you want to add her on as a very small owner. So maybe like 3% because not only can you now have like these work trips, but you can buy a business vehicle for her she can be on your 401k plan, which is huge if you have one in place, which depending on the type, you can get $61,000 per person out tax-free. So you and her, that would be $122,000 out. So like between like the vehicles, retirement stuff, trips, I think it's worth it to add a spouse onto your business, at least for a small percentage. Or you can add them on, on your board of directors as well, and that could count, which if you're an S-corp, you have to have a board of directors. So that's another, another good way to do that. And then in terms of your kids' expenses, your business can pay your kids' payroll anyway, so they can be employees, so that should count. Okay. So you have to uh, explain that because that's exciting. I think, I think a lot of people have heard that before. 
uh, I had heard it before and I heard you talk about it. It made much more sense when you kind of broke it down. So putting your kids on payroll, like do they have to be of working age or like what is that all about? So they don't have to be like the typical 16 year old, you know, kid working at their first job. If they're your own kids, there's different rules. So if they're your own child or like related to you in some capacity, then you can hire them at any age. You do need certain, you know, contracts and and forms that you have to sign. So don't just like try to do this on your own, but it's still very easy to do. And for a lot of our clients with really young kiddos, they can be a model in your business and your business pays them for use of their photos. And so the benefit of doing that is you get 12,950 out of your business tax free per kid. So if you have a couple of kids, four kids, I have a client that has eight kids, like you get a lot of money out of your business tax free. And so if you are going to use them as models, like obviously use them on your social media. So like post about like post their photos or have their photos on your website or business cards or in a marketing campaign or something like that. But as they get older, you can have them work in your business. Like we have eight-year-olds doing social media management just because like at eight, they're already, they already know that stuff, whether you like want them to or not, they're pretty good at it. And, you know, we have eight, 10, 12-year-olds handing out flyers or knocking on doors or taking out the trash. There's like so many jobs that they can do. And you're like teaching them work ethic. You're teaching them about your business. So it's like, there's many benefits to it. Wow. That's, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. My 10 year old does like iMovie videos and things like that, which I, I don't do. I've never invested the time to do that. So yeah. Editor. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, he'll be happy to know now he can get uh, paid for that. So yeah. Interesting. Like, I think, I feel like a lot of people don't know about this stuff. Like why, why is that? I think a lot of accountants, so the industry is kind of built, was built that way, like to just get as many clients as you can for January through April to file tax returns. So like kill yourself January through April. And then you worked so hard, you need a break for the rest of the year. And so in that short time frame for taxes, there's no time to like sit and like go through someone's tax return and be like, oh, okay, this guy has two kids. We can do that. They they should switch their business around and save 20000 there and blah, blah, blah. And so it's one, like a time thing. I think two, they don't teach this to you. Like I have my master's in tax. They don't teach this to you in school. It's just like learning case law and getting different certifications. And then three, I think accountants don't think that people would pay for it, even though like it's such an easy sell essentially like we're selling money at a discount. Like, would you pay X to save Y? And it's like, of course anyone would. Yeah. Wow. Uh, no, that makes a lot of sense. Cause I, I like we're, we're a marketing training company. We're not an agency. And like people ask all the time, like, yeah, why does my marketing agency suck? And a lot of things, times it's like, well, of course there are a lot of bad ones out there, but like most of them quite honestly don't charge enough money to actually like work on your marketing for more than, an, you know, a handful of hours a month. Yeah. And that's why you get like this generic, you know, garbage put out there for every company that they that they work with. So maybe it's similar with, you know, tax preparing accountants where it's just like, here's the fixed fee. There's only so many hours that we can dedicate to you, especially during busy season. And here's, you know, here's what you get. Right. Yeah, exactly. OK, so do you guys do that as well? Or do you are you just tax strategy? Do you do planning? Do you do bookkeeping? Like, what is it? How's that all break down for you guys? Yeah, we do it all. So obviously, majority of people come to us for the strategy. But then, of course, because we're doing their strategy, we have to prepare the tax returns. And then a lot of people that come to us have really messy books and don't know their numbers. And so we have a whole bookkeeping team as well. So it's really full service. Okay, that's cool. That was going to be one of my questions. I think a lot of people, a lot of business owners are maybe embarrassed about their books because they're just like a complete mess. And maybe that prevents them from taking action. It's been me in the past. What do you say to those people? Like, like what, what's your, you know, how do you handle that objection? Yeah, I mean, I see and feel a lot of that like guilt and shame that people come to us with. But it's honestly like, that's what we're here for you know, and we, right. we love the messy clients only because like, we know how much of a burden this has been on you and how much it's stressing you out. So if we can help like ease that pain, 
that is like super fulfilling on our end. So we're always just like, it's okay. Like you're really good at construction. I don't know shit about construction. So like, I'm not going to build my own house. I'm going to pay someone to do that. But that's why you pay us to like clean up and fix, fix your books for you, you know? All right. Judgment-free zone. Okay, good. I like that. And everyone has the same objective, right? It's like, hey, how can you, you know, run your business more efficiently, make more money, be able to bring home more money, you know, give away more money, whatever it is you want to do with that. Hire more people, grow your business faster. All right, cool. So I think people are, people are kind of like opening up to the idea of like, okay, I need to figure this stuff out. Yeah. Um, When it comes to contractors or any real sort of business, really, like what are some of, uh, the other fun things that that maybe we can use as a business expense that we're not currently thinking about. Um, guns and ammo is a good one. Ah, I was hoping you'd go there. So, I remember that one from the from the meetup. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people don't know that you can actually expense guns and ammo and like a concealed carry class or license or any sort of like shooting class because it's to pay for the security of your home office. Or the security if you have like an actual office, either way, both work. And so I don't think most people put that on as an expense on their profit and loss, but you can. All right. I we we could probably end the show right now. Your taxcoach.biz, go talk to Barbara, <laughs> write off all your guns and ammo. No, that's uh that, that's really fascinating. I think I asked about yeah, home office. How about that? You know, I have one. I think most people do at this point. How does that work as far as like is a percentage of your mortgage or, you know, what is that? Yeah, it should be a percentage. So that means your accountant is taking the actual expenses versus there's something called the simplified method where it maxes out at 1500 bucks. So if you're preparing your taxes on your own, which I highly don't recommend, but if you use one of those like what is it? TurboTax or something like that. They're only going to give you 1500 bucks max because their software can't calculate the actual method. But if you do take the actual method of home office deductions, you can get, I just saw someone get an $18,000 deduction just for their home office deduction. So that's huge. And so it is a, it's a percentage of what you use for business versus a percentage of your whole house. And With that, you can take your mortgage interest, your property tax, insurance, if you have a landscaper, a cleaning person, a pool person, a security system, anything for your house, right? You add it all up and you take a percentage. And so try to get as high of a percentage as you can. So it might not just be like a home office, but maybe you also have a bathroom that's just for your office or you have... um, like we have a coffee bar that's only for business. So like when my team comes over, that coffee bar is business use only. Or maybe you use your garage because you store stuff in there for your business. So you can find lots of other ways to kind of add in some square footage and get a big percentage out. And I'm still seeing or hearing people say like a home office deduction is a red flag it's not like it has not been a red flag since the late 90s when like computers at home were not very common, you know, so not mer- not many people worked at home. So it's not a red flag. Please take your home office deductions. All right. That makes sense. Yeah. Especially now, 2022 getting, in, you know, it's just like it's normal for everyone to have a home office, at least to do some kind of work. On that topic, like what defines a home office? Like if I, you know, normally work at an office, but you know, I'm bringing home my laptop and I'm doing some things like, is there a gray line there or a gray area there rather? No, you can have a brick and mortar office and a home office. You can have 10 locations and a home office. Yeah. As long as you have a designated space. All right. That's cool. Now you mentioned red flag. So I think that's probably on most people's minds, right? Like I want to do... As much as I can legally and ethically without raising any red flags with the authorities. I don't know. Talk about that. Like how often do do companies get audited? Like what, you know, is there, are there certain things that are red flags? Like, is there a method to that or no? Yeah. So the IRS has this like points system. And of course they don't tell you what the exact points are and like what will, what will ding you and what will not ding you. But essentially Every form goes through like this scanning process if you mail it in or if it's electronically filed, it's just automatically checked. But yeah, it scans your files and like gives you a point system. And if you hit a certain points, it will 
trigger a letter, not necessarily an audit, but just a letter of like, hey, can you tell us what this is? So don't freak out when you get letters. And I will say a majority of the time, like 90% of the time, the IRS is wrong. So don't just pay that letter because you get it and you're scared. Because they're usually wrong or there's some explanation for it. So please send the letter to your accountant to respond for you. But in terms of like what we know will cause an audit, a huge one is having an S corp and you're not on payroll. So that's a huge one. So don't just switch to an S corp willy nilly because you like saw it on TikTok. Really like make sure you're following the rules. And one of them is you have to be on payroll. So that's a big one. And you can get penalized up to $22,000. It's $25,000 next year. So it's a really big penalty on that. And I see it all the time. We get new clients coming in and they're like, yeah, I file as an S Corp. And I look at their return and there's a zero for officer's comp. And I'm like, no, let's amend your return really fast so the IRS doesn't catch it. But so that's a huge one. And then having really big losses on a Schedule C, which is just your personal return, which is why we like people to file business returns separately. Because you can have a business loss all you want, but it tends to be if you have a business loss on your personal return, it's a big red flag. So, but again, I always tell people like less than 1% of people get audited every year. And if you do get audited, as long as you're keep your receipts, you can justify your amounts and why you spent what you did on what whatever you did, you will be fine. And like, don't have an account that's afraid of the IRS. Like we're here for you and to like defend you, you know? So your accountant should not be afraid of getting letters or audits or anything. It's like, bring it on. I know that I know more than someone that gets paid $50,000 a year at the IRS. Like it's not a big deal. I love that sense of confidence that you want someone like Barbara on your side. It's like, you know, we all have this like, you know, image of the big bad IRS, you know, like they're going to come and throw us in jail. And, yeah. you know, now there's, I don't know, you probably know better than I do, the budgeting to hire 80,000 more IRS agents. And I don't know what that's all about. But um, but that's such a good point. Like you have an ally in someone that, you know, understands this stuff and is, you're, you're on the same side as someone like Barbara. So yeah, keep that in mind. You mentioned officer's comp. I've always wondered like how that should, you know, I've asked my accountant too, but I think it'd be value, valuable for the audience. Like, you know, you have to have some salary. I've heard it's like a market rate salary. I heard it's like, you know, what would you have to pay someone to replace yourself as the owner or CEO, whatever. Are there some guidelines as far as like, because the way I understand it is you want to have some level of salary, but you want it to be as low as acceptably possible so you can minimize your your taxes there. Yeah, nice. Um, you know more than most. Congrats. <laughs> all right. Sweet. Uh, that's two. That's two wins I have so far. Yeah. I have another a bunch of other things I'm not doing right. I'm just writing those down. I don't want to talk about those on uh on the uh public uh, media here, but um yeah, two wins so far. I'll take that. But yeah, exactly. So you want your officer's compensation to be as low as possible. But what does that really mean? And like, how do you know that it's as low as possible? There is no IRS rule. So it's not like you can look up internal revenue code 162 point blah, 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 blah. It's not going to be in there. There's no calculation for it. The only thing that we have to go on as accountants is case law. And so we can see from case law, like you were mentioning, as long as you're paying yourself like what it would cost to replace you, or market salary, or there's some cases that it's like 20% of your profits. There's some court cases that as long as your salary is in excess of what you took in distributions. So there's a ton of different ways to calculate it. And I would say as long as it's not zero, you're already better than most. So like try not to trip up on that too much because the IRS is going to pull back those returns that have zeros far faster than than you who's trying to pay themselves a reasonable amount. But there's also a software. It's called RC Reports Reasonable Compensation Software. We have it and we run it for our clients as well. It spits out like a 30-page report on what your officer's compensation should be. And so that helps too. 
Interesting. Okay. So yeah, that's what I do. I have my comp, my salary, and then I have my distributions. How do you recommend owners take distributions like monthly, quarterly? Does it matter? It really should be a percentage. Yeah, it really doesn't matter. You can take them daily, weekly, quarterly, monthly, annually. A lot of people do them at the end of the year just because they're, you know, they're so uncertain of their numbers throughout the year that at the end they just give themselves a big lump sum. Some people do it every week. Like it really doesn't matter um, if the cash is in there and you know your cash flow for what you need left in there then I say take out your distributions as much as you can because distributions are not taxed. So it's it's kind of like get it out there and have that money start working for you. Yeah. I mean that's that's why we work so hard, right? To have some of those some of those perks maybe um, as business owners. So cool. What else? Uh, any any other exciting things like guns and ammo or <laughs> you know things that we can uh, write off? Uh, like I think vehicles is probably a big topic, right? Obviously, if you're, you know, a contractor and you have your work truck, like that's pretty obvious, but then you have, you know, another vehicle, you have a Maserati or whatever it might be. Like, what's the situation there? Yeah, you can have as many vehicles, business vehicles as is quote unquote appropriate, right? But again, it's one of those IRS things. It's like, what's reasonable? What's appropriate? It's who really knows? As long as you can justify it and say, well, yes, I have this work truck to go on construction sites. And this is my work vehicle Maserati that I take to client meetings because I don't want to take a dirty work truck. Like that sounds very reasonable to me that you have kind of like the beat up car and the nice car that you kind of get prospects from. And so, yeah, there's no like limit. You could buy a Lamborghini, a Bugatti, like, hey, if you have the money and that's what you want to buy, you can totally expense it in your business. And so that's why you see a ton of people buying G-Wagons or like the Lamborghini Urus because they're over 6,000 pounds and you get a hundred percent deduction for vehicles over 6,000 pounds at least only till the end of the year. I don't know when this will air, but that's only till December 31st. And then it goes down to 80% next year. So the weight of the vehicle also matters. Is the weight, and I've heard that that's like section 179 or something like that. Yeah, that's that's for accelerated depreciation. So let's say you bought like a Maserati sports car. It's not going to be 6,000 pounds, right? That doesn't mean that you don't get the expense it just means that you take the expense over five years instead of one year. So you bought a $100,000 vehicle. If it's over 6,000 pounds, you get to take $100,000 as an expense this year, even though maybe you didn't, you know, you just financed it. So you're paying a thousand bucks a month. You still get to take a hundred grand. But if it's a sports car under 6,000, you would just take a hundred thousand divided by five because five years you get 20,000 a year and deduction. So you still get it. It's just over five years. All right. Interesting. What's the significance of the 6,000 pounds? I don't know. I, I think I think the IRS just, what, they were incentivizing manufacturing for like GM trucks at the time when they made those rules. So that's another like thing with the tax laws is whenever there's changes, what they're doing is they're trying to curve behavior in a way that they want you to spend money. So like the Trump tax laws was to incentivize manufacturing and building things in the U.S. And now with the tax law changes this year and in 23, it's really incentivizing investing into solar. And what else? Solar is the big one and pharmaceuticals. And so it really just like curbs behavior. Sometimes they really incentivize real estate. Sometimes it's manufacturing. Sometimes it's low income housing. So it's, it's really to like, yeah, I don't know. Brainwash. It, it's it, kind of weird. <laughs> it depends. It depends who's uh, lobbying the, the government the hardest. Uh, yes. What, what industries pretty much it sounds like. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. That's interesting. So go out and get your G wagons for your wives, for your spouses, for Christmas, for holidays, do it before the end of the year. Car dealerships are going to be bananas in December because everyone, all the business owners are going to be flooding there in December to get their cars that are over 6,000 pounds before the tax law changes January 1st. The downside is if you order a car and it's not here by December 31st, you don't get the rule The you have to have the car 
in hand. Ah, uh, okay. Well, from what I hear, like G wagons are really hard to come by as it is, so that's probably going to be tough. So you yeah, need to get you'd have something. to get a used one. They didn't make G wagons this year at all. Oh, yeah. interesting. Mercedes had a something with the V eight engines, a shortage of V eight. Oh wow! So that's why they've gone up so much. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this all makes sense. Okay. I can write these things off. I'm getting excited. I can save some money. I can bring some money home. I can pay my kids, you know, keep more money in the household. How does a business owner go about doing this? Like, is this something that, you know, and this probably ties into the, how you guys structure the services that you provide, but like, this is, sounds like it's not something that you do once a year. It's like something that you kind of plan for in advance and maybe do on a quarterly basis or like, how do you, how do you do tax strategy? If that's even a good question. Yeah, exactly. So we have our first kind of like intro call. It's 30 minutes, really get to know just like your business and what your goals are. Then we go back, we come up with a strategy plan. So these are all the strategies you're missing and and we can implement in your business. So then we have like an hour, hour and a half call of like, these are all the things we're going to implement for you. Not that you have to do anything, but we do it for you, but we just like you to know about it. And then it's a quarterly check-in after that, you have full access to the whole team. You can always ask questions. We have like a chat system that's really cool. So you're like at the dealership and you're like, hey, do I have to get this financed in the business name or can I, you know, put it in my personal name, stuff like that. And so we can answer right away. But yeah, it is like a quarterly cycle of we at least want to chat with you quarterly. And if you have questions in between, obviously, we'll support. Okay. That makes sense. So it's not something that you wait till the end of the year and you're like, all right, I need to like, you know, figure out what I can buy for Christmas so that I can write off everything. I mean, we get plenty (laughs) of those people as well. So like right now is our busiest time for sure. Cause like nobody thinks about taxes until the very end of the year. And so they come to us and they're like, crap, I made a million dollars this year. Like how, how can I lower my tax burden? And we're like, okay, we'll hurry up and like, let's put this plan together. We can, yeah, we can still work with it. It's just always better if we have like a longer runway. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we all like this week I thought about it. I was like, I need to get new podcasting equipment, the whole thing. I was like, I'll just wait till December and like, you know, I'll get it then. But like, you know, I know I'm going to get it. There's no reason I shouldn't do it now. Or maybe just wait till Black Friday Black to get Friday, a sale yeah. or something like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So that makes sense. This is your busiest time of year. I get it. I'm going to circle back real quick. I meant to ask this when you're talking about like paying no taxes. And I think it's a common question as a business owner, going to buy a house, you know, going to get financing for whatever it is. Obviously they want to see some kind of income there, right? So how do you like, what do you recommend as far as the balance between paying as little in taxes, but also wanting to show some income, you know, on your, on your, you know, on your statements? Yeah. Good question. We do this a lot with our clients who are buying houses or a lot of investment properties. And there's a few ways, like you can still have a W2 income that can cover the house payment that you want to purchase. And so kind of like not having any profits or a loss in your business won't really affect it that much. Or what we do a lot, it's called a non-qualified mortgage. And it's was made for business owners. And really, they don't look at your tax returns at all. They look at your business bank statements to see what's coming in and do you have the runway to make a house payment. And so they give you a mortgage just based on what you're bringing in, gross receipts. And so non-qualified mortgage, you will pay like 1% higher than a normal like mortgage, you know, traditional mortgage product. But those are really, really good for business owners that probably that 1% higher in interest is worth paying than paying the taxes on all of your profits. So that's a good one. Also, we write letters all the time to mortgage officers that say, okay, it might say their profit was 100000 but we're going to add back this. We're going to add back depreciation, add back this. And so really their profit, taxable profit, is like 300000 So base their loan off of that. And the loan officer nine out of 10 times is like, okay, great. Okay, good. As long as you can kind of like provide a compelling argument that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I gotcha. Yeah. I went through that a couple of years ago and it's like, you know, they, they go through everything in the business and it's like, where'd this money come from? Like, yeah, all that sort big of thing. deposits, so, big, you know, 
debits out. Yeah, I know they question everything. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> well, that that's good to know because I think uh, you know that's a common question. Obviously. Cool. Well, I want to start to wrap it up here. Any other tips for contractors, uh, Barbara, that like, you know, things that you see over and over again, you're like, man, just like, you know, don't do this guys or girls, or, you know, I don't want to single out guys, but like, you know, just don't do this or do this because you're going to save yourself a lot of money. Yeah. Like really saving your receipts, keeping things separate. So like have a business bank account, a personal bank account, don't mix them together because that gets really messy. And knowing your profitability. And then you don't want to do this forever, right? And I see a lot in the construction contractor industry that you're not saving for yourself for retirement. So like either think of a retirement plan, like a traditional 401k or something, or like invest your money into things so that you eventually can retire, you know? Yeah. Get off the roof, get out of the truck, you yeah. know, uh, that makes sense. Do you guys do that too? Or is that more in like financial planning or another kind of, you know, area or what? So we won't implement the 401k plan or anything like that. Cause we're not financial advisors, but we definitely, you know, we're like, Hey, this plan is a business deduction and you're saving for yourself. So it's like double whammy. So we do the tax side of it and can definitely advise on like what we would do. For sure. Got it. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah. I mean, it seems like a no brainer, like, you know, to hire, you know, or at least inquire with someone like, like Barbara who can, you know, of course our services aren't free, but it sounds to me like you're going to identify ways where it's a no brainer, where you're saving your clients much more than what they're, you know, investing in a service like yours, I assume. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So we always calculate your savings before working with us. So, cause we don't want to take on a client that we're not saving you more than you're paying us, right? Because that doesn't make sense. That's the easiest sales pitch in the world. It's like, you know, you pay me pay me $1, we're going to save you five. Like, yeah. I mean, do, do people say no to that? Not very often. <laughs> nice, nice. Good industry to get into. Uh, well, the good thing for you is that like, you know, it's not something like, like roofing or marketing where someone could just start that type of business tomorrow. Like, obviously you have a a wealth of experience and a, an awesome team and all those certifications and all these, you know, all this knowledge. So that's a, a high barrier to entry in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. Cool, Barbara. Well, thanks so much for uh, for sharing some of these tips. I think we'll have a lot of uh, people reaching out to you at least to just kind of learn more about like, all right, you know, I want to do some of this stuff like here, you know, make it happen for me. So yeah. uh, what's the best place for them to get in touch with you to, to learn more? Honestly, Instagram, if you're not following us on Instagram already, it's your tax coach. We drop like daily tips and tricks on how to save in taxes. You can just DM me there. It's me in the DMs and your tax coach.com or dot biz. We own them all now. We didn't before, but now we do. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I think I was at the dot biz, but the dot com is definitely just more. It. We just you know. got it. <laughs> All right, you you graduated to the dot com. Yeah, Congratulations! Thank you. <laughs> uh, you're you're a real you're a real business now. I know. All right, that's <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, thanks so much. I don't I don't like you know bring people on our show to uh, you know that I don't believe in, and I I know that uh, this stuff is is game changing. So thanks so much for sharing, Barbara, and uh, hope to uh, talk to you soon. All right, thanks. 